Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames, Associate Curator of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. This is Season 2, History Behind the Scenes, in which we explore the Rosenbach's remarkable historical collections, travel behind the scenes into the work of the institution to preserve its treasures, and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day American civic life. This episode kicks off a fun miniseries titled Rosenbach Test Kitchen, in which my colleagues and I prepare exquisite culinary dishes inspired by historic menus in the Rosenbach's collection. The founders of the Rosenbach Museum and Library, brothers Dr. A.S.W. and Philip Rosenbach, had many interests and assembled impressive collections in a large variety of areas. Their largest collecting area? The history of the Americas. Dr. Rosenbach, in particular, loved American history, and to this day, materials documenting the political, social, intellectual, and literary history of North and South America are the single largest collecting area at our institution. These collections contain iconic artifacts of life in the Americas from the 1500s to the middle of the 20th century, as well as rare and precious books and manuscripts that reveal remarkable stories about everyday people and everyday life across many eras in America's past. Much of this podcast season will be devoted to exploring those stories, and to get started, we've decided to do so in a rather unconventional way. Many of us on the Rosenbach staff are passionate cooks and bakers, and of course we all love to eat and enjoy one another's company. What's more, our collections contain wonderful artifacts that document food culture in centuries past. So, we've created Rosenbach Test Kitchen, in which three of us will create culinary dishes inspired by some historic hotel-restaurant menus in our holdings, and then submit them for assessment to some of our colleagues. We've decided to focus on two specific menus for our inspiration. The first is a menu from the Revere House Hotel in Boston, Massachusetts on April 17, 1855, and the second is from the Burnett House of Cincinnati, Ohio on May 13, 1855. My fellow Rosenbach Test Kitchen contestants are Joby Zink, the Registrar of the Rosenbach, and Kelsey Scouten Bates, the John C. Haas Director of the Rosenbach. Our distinguished culinary judges are Judith M. Gustin, Curator and Senior Director of Collections at the Rosenbach, and Elizabeth E. Fuller, the Librarian of the Rosenbach. Today, we've gathered together in the reading room here at the Rosenbach to study some of the materials in our collection that relate to foodways and consider our next steps in preparing some dishes to share. Judy, thank you so much for joining me on the Rosenbach podcast today. Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here. I'm hoping that you can tell me a little bit about the American history collections at the Rosenbach, just to establish some context for Rosenbach Test Kitchen. What was Dr. Rosenbach's interest in American history, and how do we use these holdings that Dr. Rosenbach and his brother gathered and that we have expanded upon today? How would you compare this collecting area to other uh, collecting areas here at the Rosenbach? Well, just as a lot of people's um, memories around food start with their families, Dr. Rosenbach's interest in American history started with his. From the time he was a really young boy, he spent time with his maternal uncle, Moses Pollock, who was um, probably the first antiquarian book dealer in Philadelphia, and really was able to have access to the collections that he himself had there, and, you know, found in these holdings a way to understand the past and to bring it nearer to him, which he often talks about. So it so happened that um, his first experience is there looking at works of George Washington and Benjamin Franklin so inspired him that by the time um, Moses Pollock uh, died and left an estate that included the materials from his own bookshop, Dr. Rosenbach was able to um, acquire these materials um, for a very low cost, um, and they're still part of our collections today. So our collection in American history includes these very first um, materials from uh, Moses Pollock's shop and was built by Dr. Rosenbach over time. 
When he worked with Moses Pollock, his uncle, um, his uncle put his arm around him. Um, and this reminds me of a scene from the movie The Graduate, where um, Elaine's father, Mr. Robinson, puts his arm around Benjamin, then somewhat aimless after graduating from college, and says, go into plastic, son. So here is Moses Pollock putting his arm around a young A.B., saying, collect Americana. And in fact, this was a time period when collecting Americana was um, very accessible to those who sought it out. And uh, European stuff was, was much more uh, sought after by many collectors and much more expensive. So Dr. Rosenbach lived and worked at a time when collecting Americana was quite accessible to him. And we benefit from that as an institution because he was able to really grow this collection of Americana um, over his lifetime, and we've added to it since. So Americana, or American history, is actually our largest sub-collection of all of those here, um, larger than our more well-known uh, English literature collection, and has many pockets in it that uh, you know trace American history over time and over geography. And so we use it today in all aspects of our work for programs such as our behind the bookcase tours where people can come and see the artifacts in person and even handle them to our exhibitions um, and other ways of sharing this collection with the public. So um, this is a great opportunity for us to explore our American history collection in a way that we have not yet tried. Thanks so much for uh, introducing us to sort of that the history of American history collecting uh, here at the Rosenbach, Judy. Elizabeth, first off, thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Much appreciated. Thanks, Alex. It's always fun to talk about the collections and when we get to talk about food, too. <laughs> even, How fun is that? Even better, yeah. Elizabeth, can you tell us what some of the particular strengths of our American history holdings at the Rosenbach are? The bulk of the American historical collections cover the period from the very earliest European explorations, around 1500, up through the American Civil War. From the beginning, uh, it covers both North and South America, and as we come upward in time toward uh, United States independence, the geographic focus tends to narrow, and there's uh, more particularly um, to do with the United States. Some of the main types of material are explorers and travelers' descriptions of the land and its peoples, uh, first of all, uh, encounters with Native Americans, and second, as European uh, settlement spreads through the continent, descriptions of travelers to newly settled places. There are also the documents of uh, the laws and legal documents, as well as political pamphlets and treatises relating to the expansion of settlements and the establishment of government in various places. There are uh, religious works for the use of Christian missionaries and their converts. There are letters and other writings, professional and personal, of not only political, military, and cultural leaders, but also letters, diaries, and a lot of legal documents recording moments in the lives of ordinary people, some of whose names we know and some of which we don't. There are a lot of books produced in the Americas that tell the story of the establishment and growth of printing, and it's spread throughout the continent. And as um, as a collection established by a collector. There are um, a, a number of things that reflect various firsts, the uh, first, not only first books published in particular places, but first things in various genres, including cookbooks. Kelsey Bates, thank you so much for joining us on the Rosenbach podcast and for joining in as a contestant in the Rosenbach Test Kitchen. I'm delighted to be here. Kelsey, our American history holdings, as Judy sort of uh, suggested uh, a moment ago, are perhaps a little less known than some of our other collections. Why do you think it's important to focus our attention on our American history collections? And what role do the records of America's past play in informing our understanding of the present moment? Well, I think a lot of us, Alex, when we think back to our days in school and learning history, we think about how we learned history, and it was 
often a very chronological way of learning. Uh, we learned about wars, battles, treaties, various political um, types of history. And the great thing about our collection here at the Rosenbach is that we can learn about history in a new way. We can learn cultural and social history by looking at our collection. For example, I personally can learn a lot about history by understanding how people dressed, how they fixed their hair, how they, uh, what they were reading, what they were cooking. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in this exercise. And by learning about how people were cooking, we can learn a lot about who they were, what their values were, how they interacted with each other, and what they held important to them uh, in their communities and in their homes. And in my opinion, that provides a much more interesting and nuanced way of looking at history than simply memorizing chronology and names and birth and death dates. And I think that's the real value of a history collection like ours, is that we can take social history and cultural history, and that means a lot more to us. It's much more relevant to us in contemporary uh, culture than anything else, because everyone eats. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, and yes, as you say, everybody eats, which leads me to a question for Elizabeth. Can you give me a sense of where we can find historic recipes and historic menus in the Rosenbach's collection? Well, wherever we have records of people's lives, we're likely to have records of what they ate. So there are in the uh, American Historical Collections uh, cookbooks and recipes and menus from travelers' accounts as uh, as as well as uh, cookbooks per se. But there are recipes and menus in all the rest of the collections. One of our Incunabula, our 15th century printed books, has a collection of fish recipes in it. There are menus and cookbooks. The Rosenbach family papers and the Rosenbach company papers, which account, include a lot of uh, things related to all aspects of the brothers' lives, have not only cookbooks but menus from gatherings of various social and business organizations they belong to. The papers of the 20th century poet Marianne Moore uh, include recipes and cookbooks. And we have uh, similar material from uh, the lives and papers of other historical and literary figures from Thomas Jefferson to Charles Dickens. Wow, it's really, really amazing to think of how omnipresent this sort of material is throughout our collection. Judy, I see that you've pulled a special book from, from our library collection here at the Rosenbach that I take it has something to do with, with recipes and cooking. Yes, Alex. Um, so um, Hannah Glass, who was born in 1708, published uh, her cookbook, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, in 1747. And it became the best-selling recipe book of the 18th century and was reprinted within its first year of publication and eventually um, was printed through 20 editions throughout the century. Um, she wrote two other books on housekeeping, but neither was as popular as this first one was. So the circumstances of its writing had to do with um, her marriage. She eloped uh, with her much older uh, husband at age 16, and they struggled to make ends meet. And this book was their effort to earn money. This is a time before plagiarism laws. So Glass's book contained about a third of its content that uh, were recipes that had already been published elsewhere. But among her original recipes were the first or early references to flavors and styles of cooking that were imported to England, and also newly introduced foods like ice cream, and the names for foods that became standard because of her mention of them in her book. So this book stands as a kind of time capsule for English cooking at the time, but also highlights the competitive nature of national cooking, as Glass shows a clear distaste for French cuisine. How surprising. Some rivalries run, run deep, I suppose. Yeah, they, they do. 
Thanks, Judy. And Elizabeth, I see that you have pulled for us to look at here in the reading room two very different artifacts of early uh, American cooking and, and recipes. So what, what do you have for us to see here? Well, these are both from the papers of Marianne Moore, uh, who, although she had a complicated relationship to food, did have an interest in nearly everything, including science and nutrition, and also um, uh, kept a number of family books and papers going back to the middle of the 19th century. So first, we have um, the product of another very influential uh, woman cookbook author. This is an undated edition of a book first published in 1886. And uh, this dates from probably the, ah, this is the first edition mm -hmm. of the Philadelphia Cookbook by Sarah Tyson Rohrer, who has been described as the first American dietitian who uh, published a number of cookbooks, edited cooking magazines, and um, was an early exponent of what was known then as domestic science. In fact, this subtitle is A Manual of Home Economics. We don't see evidence of uh, more family use in terms of annotations, but certainly, like all good cookbooks, it falls open to certain pages and there are spots and stains on some things which certainly indicate that it's been used as it was intended to be. This cookbook uh, is represented, there's another edition in the collection which belonged to the Rosenbach brother's mother, Isabella Pollock Rosenbach. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is quite a, a, a significant book. The other thing I've got here, uh, you can see is well, almost a century later, it's a very 1950s sort of plastic box. Thanks to Judy for that early plastics reference. It is marked Recipes from the Brooklyn Eagle, which is Marianne Moore's uh, adopted hometown newspaper. Uh, it was the, the box was available uh, and um, sorry, the box was available to subscribers who would then get um, a series of cards periodically. And they are divided into sections like recipes of all nations, Yuletide treats, thrifty meals, dishes men like, there's one, <laughs> quick meals for hot days, backyard spreads, tricks or treats, etc. Um, Moore has uh, added at the back a few uh, recipe cards from elsewhere and one or two little uh, recipes clipped from newspapers. Wow. I'm very curious to know what dishes men like. Well, let's what do we, see. What do we have here? Dishes I'm, men I'm going to like. guess meatloaf. <laughs> For some reason, that seems... Let's see. Uh, how about treating father to, some, to, to something special this June? Dishes men like include a series of recipes for tested favorites that men really go for. Of course, there's an apple pie, chocolate cake, a custard rice pudding, cheese biscuits, and to make use of June's plentiful supply of broilers and fryers, there's a fried chicken delight and a creamed chicken pie, plus a roast beef and an Italian spaghetti milanese. Hmm. Try treating the men folk to extra special this month. Remember, wow. Father's Day is June 20th this year. I mean, yep. nothing says man like custard rice pudding. You <laughs> <laughs> must be a man because everything in there says a It does sound quite tasty, yeah. doesn't it? Here is roast of beef, mm. apple mm -hmm. crumb pie, mm -hmm. chicken pie. Chicken pie. Here's the spaghetti milanese. Mm -hmm. So we're back to, and, and cheese biscuits. So we're back to our pasta and our cheese. Wow. Okay, cool. Well, there you go. Recipes that the men folk will very much enjoy. Joby Zink, Registrar of the Rosenbach, thank you so much for joining me on the Rosenbach podcast today. And thanks for participating with us in Rosenbach Test Kitchen. Oh, I'm so excited to be here um, on the podcast and especially in the test kitchen. So sitting in front of you is one of the most incredible manuscript artifacts uh, related to historic foodways that we have here 
uh, in the Rosenbach's collection. Judy and Elizabeth have just shared with us some other really incredible works, but this one is special and has really provided a lot of inspiration for the test kitchen. Can you tell me a little bit more about what we're looking at together here? Absolutely. So this is a travel journal that belonged to James Edward Moxon, um, and you can see his little uh, book plate at the front. And he um, is traveling in the United States and Canada from April 11th, 1855 through August 1855. And it's kind of a, a travel journal, scrapbook, amazing resource. Um, he has his itinerary of routes, and then he describes so much every day, what he's seeing. It's just phenomenal. So here, um, it starts on April 11th, 1855. It says, landed in Boston, 45 days from uh, Table Bay, CGH, which is Cape of Good Hope. Um, and for, he left in February, February 21st. So 45 days later, he lands in Boston. And then um, he's going from Boston to New York. New York to Philadelphia, to Baltimore, to Washington. And in um, the columns to the right, he tells um, how many miles the distance is, the amount of time that it takes, and how much it costs. And then on the next page, he's saying uh, about the roads that he took. So he went from Philadelphia from um, Baltimore Road and Baltimore to Washington via railroad. Um, and it's super fun. And then inside, he, um, he mentions that he's traveling first class. All of his boat and railroad passages are first class. And in each town where he's visiting, he describes what he's seeing. And he stays in Boston at the um, Revere House. And he describes it as an excellent first class hotel. And if we have a menu, we actually have two menus. We have a breakfast menu, um, which is not attached. And then a little later, and that one, the breakfast menu is not actually dated, but the dinner menu is dated from April 17th, 1855. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that breakfast is very big. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of meat. There are broiled beef steaks, pork steaks, mutton chops, calf liver, etc., etc. Then there's also fried breakfast things such as pig's feet and veal and mutton kidneys. Um, and that goes on. And then there's fish. There's codfish with pork, fish balls, hash fish, smelts with pork, broiled mackerel, broiled smoked salmon, halibut, and stewed oysters. But then, like, Below that, he has handwritten in broiled sea bass, and he even writes with the long S. Mm -hmm. um, so I am assuming that's what he had. Um, and then there's eggs and omelets. Your egg options are boiled, fried, scrambled, or dropped. Meaning poached, I take it? I assume that would be what that is. Um, and there's omelets and then potatoes. Um, and then there's the... The breads or the more traditional breakfast foods, such as the hot rolls, graham rolls, brown bread, buckwheat cakes, hominy, fried Indian pudding. It's a lot of fun. Wow. So some things we still very much associate with breakfast, but a lot of a lot of items that seem a little out of place, perhaps, on a breakfast menu today. Right. Um, and then, interestingly, um, the amount of meat for dinner is, is similar-ish, but... Not as much, really. Um, it seems that breakfast is a little bit larger, mm -hmm. um, actually. So for dinner, you can have soup a la julienne. The fish is either a boiled halibut with lobster sauce. And then there's um, calf's head and pluck, turkey and oyster, a leg of mutton with caper sauce, Boston ham, tongue, and then corned beef and cabbage. Wow. Amazing. Um, there's a lot of side dishes that include like oyster patties, lobster with anchovy sauce, kidneys with port wine sauce. There's rice in forms, which just means it's molded. Um, there's macaroni with cheese, blanquette of lamb. Um, what's fascinating here is there's virtually no vegetables listed 
in this menu. I yeah. suppose Boston in mid-April wouldn't have been the place in the 1850s to go looking for fresh produce, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense if you're eating you're eating what's available, mm-hmm. and I can't imagine what vegetables are <laughs> available in Boston in April 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and these these menus are so interesting because not only do they have this fascinating text, but they're also beautiful examples of printing and have all sorts of illustrations and show us what the Revere House looked like at the time as well. Right, right. And then this one also has like it has an extensive wine list of Madeira, Sherry, um, Port, Burgundy, Claret, um, and then desserts and pastries. What are some of the desserts on offer? Um, well, there's a bird's nest pudding. No idea what that means. Me neither. There's apple pie. There's, oh, Alex, there's a Russian harp. Yes. And I see a mince pie as well. Yeah. That sounds tasty. I think I'm just going to stick with a lemon ice cream yeah. or almonds. Hard to go wrong there. So this is kind of fun. This is the gentleman's ordinary. Um, it says over here on the bottom in small pre- print, a gentleman having friends to dine will please give notice at the office. Early dinner served in ladies ordinary from one to two only. Oh, huh. so segregated on the basis of gender in the, in the dining rooms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And children occupying seats at the table will be charged full price. Ah, some things never change. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how interesting. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, he talks all about everything where he's visiting, um, the hotels, the sites. Um, it's much fun. He crossed the Charles River by long wooden bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that there's a list of cocktails that particularly captured your attention of in this course, volume. Of course, of course, yes. So it's a handwritten list of cocktails that he found at a Boston saloon, um, no name given. And there's a list of like 35 cocktails. There we go. The first item on the list is a plain fruit julep. So um, that's just going to be something cold and sweet um, and served with ice. And that's how you're going to know that it's um, that you're at a decadent place because ice is rare um, and expensive. Then there's a bunch of other juleps. There's the peach julep and the capped julep. And then there's the sherry and claret cobblers, which are going to have muddled fruit and a red wine, obviously the sherry or the claret. Um, I like to make mine with a little splash of seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> there's one for you. Ah, uh, eggnog. Yeah. So not just a Christmas time drink. Nope. And then there's milk punch, Stonewall. Mm-hmm. Poor, poor man's punch, I think I see. Probably, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. The gin rooster tail. Uh-huh. A smasher. Port wine, Regis. The Vito. <laughs> I wonder what's in that. And the Vox Populi. Yep. Brandy Smash. Gum Tickler. The Poker. Yeah. Soda Punch. All sorts of wonderful, wonderful drink options here. I wonder what's in the fancy mixed julep. The fancy mixed julep. Wow. It's not going to be made with bourbon. I sense some inspiration coming your way. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Joby, for introducing this wonderful manuscript. So um, a bird's nest pudding yeah. is um, dried fruit stuffed baked apples in a pie crust surrounded by cake. It's called the turducken of desserts. Oh, oh. oh that's very cute, actually. <laughs> yeah. It sounds complicated. It sounds too... Yeah. I don't know. It sounds, overly it sounds medieval. Yeah. yeah. It does. Kind of, you expect something to fly out of it, though. Mm-hmm. 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 So, Judy, Joby just told us all about this wonderful artifact in our collection. And I'm wondering if you could say maybe a couple of words about the significance of a book like this, not simply for the human interest, that you know, we get this insight into another man's life, another person's life, or the details of his daily existence, you know, moving up and down the eastern seaboard. What role can an object like this play in helping us better understand American history in the way that Kelsey was talking about a little bit earlier? Sure. Well, I think that it helps to look at it, what it is physically um, to understand it a little better. It serves the role as um, both a travel diary and an album 
So there are objects inserted in there, as, jo- as Joby um, referred to, these um, various menus from the places that he visited. Um, and he traces his travels across some of America's you know, best trodden geography um, to eat the food of that area. So this not only gives us um, a connection across time, um, some people keep travel diaries, other people sort of journal and put things that they collect into some kind of container for that. Um, so, you know, this is really something that many people can relate to. Um, and also, because it relates food and travel, we may think of ourselves in the position where, you know, if I asked you, what was the best meal you ever ate? For a lot of us, that would be something that we ate when we were traveling. Uh, you know, you're in a place that is different. Your spirit is probably a little bit different than it would be at home. Um, and it gives you a better opportunity to enjoy the food and beverages of the space that you're in at that time. So I think it helps us connect with his experience right off the bat. But because he's traveling across some some amount of geography, it helps us also understand why the food being offered might be what it is. Um, Joby mentioned that he's traveling first class, so we have to remind ourselves that this is not an experience that everyone in America had then or now. Um, the ability to travel to try other cuisines um, and to stay in, in places where we are, you know, ultimately quite comfortable um, and eat meals that are intended for people to pay a good number of dollars for them. So um, it helps us understand a little bit more about the change in taste over time. Some of the things that he might have mentioned here might not be the taste um, within upper class cuisine now, although you may look at this and say, there's a lot of organ meat on there. And that, you know, more adventurous eating has become a little bit more um, uh, synonymous with um, sort of more upper class dining today. So, um, you know, we may see that the, some trends just change over time, as well as some of them that may stay the same. So, um, you know, we can look at what he's eating and also think about how food traveled or didn't travel around the country back in the time he was writing. So, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, well before food was fresh food, let's say, was trucked all over the, the, the continent, even coming from uh, countries outside of the United States to just, you know, to serve our needs here. So we may notice that there's an absence of um, green vegetables, except for Joby's asparagus that she'll be cooking. But, um, you know, there's just not a lot of salad being offered here, right? And it could be simply because um, either there's a taste for things other than, than fresh vegetables, or because it's just out of season at the time that he's experiencing it. And so we have to revert to things that are raised in that area because most of the time, people at that time were eating things that were only produced locally. Thanks for that context. I think it's so helpful to bear in mind that there's a lot we do know about him and his life and where he found himself, but there's also a lot that we don't know yeah. and you know, that maybe is unknowable or requires a, a deep sort of context about the geographies through which he was traveling. Mm-hmm. Now it's time for the moment of truth when we are going to talk about the recipes that we have selected for this cutthroat competition in which we are about to engage. And it wasn't easy, listeners, I'll tell you, you there are so many recipes from which to choose in these menus and so many different ways of conceptualizing this project that we opted um, to try to put together a, a good comprehensive menu based on the recipes that we selected. And um, you know, balancing different things like availability of ingredients, the ability to, to do enough research to know how to prepare certain foods, making sure that we were meeting the dietary needs of our distinguished panel of judges. Um, so all of these issues played into the recipes that we chose using these menus from the Moxon Journal. So with that, I will pose to my colleague Joby, uh, what what recipes did you decide to choose? What menu items did you decide to make? as part of this competition on which you will be judged. Thanks, Alex. Um, As you know, and I don't think anyone else cares, but my dog's name is Bourbon. Um, So I had to choose a julep, even though, as I I already mentioned, a historic julep wouldn't contain bourbon. So I'm going to challenge myself and make a historic bourbon with um, brandy. Um, Mm, I'm not sure if it's going to be peach or strawberry. Well, we'll see. Okay. 
Cool. And you certainly have a lot of inspiration from that list of cocktails yes. to help you structure what you offer. And any other dishes that you'll be preparing for um, Rosenbach Test Kitchen? Right. So there is, um, I love salad. Um, and salad is not on any of those menus. Um, and vegetables were a little lacking. Mm -hmm. um, so when I saw that there was asparagus with eggs, um, I really wanted to try my hand at that. Um, I know that Judy is a vegetarian and I lean toward vegetarian friendly food. So mm -hmm. I think asparagus with eggs um, is going to be fun. Although I imagine that they might have served it. I can't decide if they've served it boiled to death mm. or if it would have been steamed. Ah, I mean, my inclination is to throw it on the grill. Yeah. Um, but. Well, I mean. You I'll know. probably steam it. I think that that seems like Purely a happy medium. Like we will we'll actually want to eat it. Right. And I won't be judged too harshly. Yeah. The idea of boiled asparagus doesn't really appeal to me. No, with like, an egg slathered on top. Right. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. But, but I have to say, though, we'll have to talk to the judges because I think if. If we want to do something that's sort of inspired by the past, but appropriate to the modern palate, I don't really see that as a bad thing necessarily. But you know, Judy and Elizabeth will have to be the ones to make that determination for us, I think. I think they'll help determine if it's a fried egg or a, a poached <laughs> egg that goes on top, because yeah. I feel like a poached egg is probably more accurate to mm -hmm. the time period. Yeah. Um, yeah. They definitely had that ability. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And how about, I, I understand that you're also going to make a dessert item for us as well. Yeah. I'm going to go with that lemon ice cream. There's, um, I mean, to end with a little tang at the back of the tooth. Um, yeah. and uh, sort of cleanse the palate a little bit. Right. A right. refreshing treat at, after all this heavy food. Right. Especially because mm -hmm. I believe you're planning on making some meat cookies stuff oh yeah so i am not a vegetarian and i lean actively away from vegetarianism <laughs> so i'm going to be making a meat dish well one of my dishes is a meat dish so um i have two recipes on which i'm focusing for the rosenbach test kitchen one of which is a potage a la julienne basically a vegetable soup it doesn't strike me at first glance as being um, particularly, you know, radically different from a vegetable soup that one might encounter today. Maybe some different kinds of vegetables, depending on what historic recipe you're looking at. So I'm going to be making a vegetable soup, and I've already started doing a little bit of research about uh, what what that might look like, what what vegetables I might need to find, and I, you know, I'll have to think carefully about the question of seasoning. And again, this is where our judges are going to have to be involved because I made, not too terribly long ago, I made a brown Windsor soup, which was Queen Victoria's favorite soup, and it was incredibly bland, which I oh. should have known going into it, of course, but yeah, it wasn't pleasing to my palate. And so I don't know exactly you know, how, I, how I'm going to conceptualize what constitutes success with this vegetable soup. So we'll look forward to doing more digging into that issue. The other dish I'm making, I'm, I'm really, really excited about. I'm going to be making turkey with oysters. Ooh. And <laughs> the oysters have two different components. One is an oyster stuffing in the turkey. And the other is, is, is a gravy, so an oyster gravy. And I, you know, I love turkey and I love oysters. I had never once thought of putting the two together. And I'm very intrigued by this unique flavor uh, portfolio that will be created. And, you know, one of the wonderful things about working here at the Rosenbach is having supportive colleagues. And Joby, I owe you one because you found for me a wonderful recipe for turkey with oysters. Yeah, that's the same book where I found my, um, it's from like 1855. Right. So it's perfectly timed to match with our, with our moxen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's also a recipe for, um, in this this book is also the recipe for the lemon ice cream that I'm playing. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So um, we, this is something typically that we do when we're doing research. We may have an object in the collection that has some information, but we need to go to other collections to find other bits of information. Uh, and this is a recipe book currently in the collection of uh, James Madison University's uh, Carrier Library Special Collections Department, and we're going to be able to make use of it as we make these historic recipes. And, I mean, it's a, a wonderful recipe um, that gives me a lot of detail about how to make an oyster turkey. I don't think I want to make a whole turkey for this <laughs> <laughs> for this event. I'm just that seems like a lot for me to to bite off literally and figuratively. 
Um, so I'm going to see if I can't modify this a little bit. And I'm feeling creative in this enterprise, by which I mean I'm looking at this as a source for inspiration, and I want to put a little bit of my modern spin on it. Uh, so we'll see how the judges respond to that. I don't know. But great. Well, thank you, Joby. I think our, our, our recipes are coming together really well. And now I'm going to ask Kelsey to share the recipe that she's making for a remarkably um, historic and unusual and wonderful dish. Kelsey, tell me about the, the, the dish that you have decided to make as part of Rosenbach Test Kitchen. Well, actually, Alex, my colleagues chose for me. Ah, I do remember that. And I think I know why. Um, (laughs) They've chosen for me macaroni and cheese, which doesn't sound at first like a very historic recipe, but it actually is. It can be traced all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, who uh, was a connoisseur of pasta and certainly of cheese, which Judy will talk about in a little while. And uh, I find this dish extremely interesting, the history of this dish extremely interesting, because what started out as a very simple dish, probably just vermicelli with some Parmesan cheese and salt, is now an extremely complicated dish to make. And it is probably one of the most judged casserole dishes that one could make. Mm -hmm. And I think my colleagues chose this for me because I lived in the Deep South for many years. And as many people know, particularly uh, where I lived in Birmingham, Alabama, macaroni and cheese is considered a vegetable. Did you know this? Wow. (laughs) Yes. If you go to any cafeteria where you get uh, a cafeteria known as a meat and three, Mm -hmm. you get a meat and three side dishes, three vegetables, and you're very likely will choose okra, fried, mm-hmm. uh, collard greens with pork in it, and macaroni and cheese. Those are your, probably going to be your three vegetables that you'll get uh. with, your, with your meat. So I have eaten many, many forms of macaroni and cheese. I have uh, experimented with many recipes of macaroni and cheese. And my choice for this uh, contest is to go as far away from Thomas Jefferson as possible because uh, I want to win. I want (laughs) to (laughs) win. Well, why don't we just put it on up there? (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, Mr. Jefferson, but your macaroni and cheese is too boring. I'm going to go as southern and as comfort level as possible. I'm going to use a lot of cheese. I'm going to use a lot of butter. I probably will put breadcrumbs on top. Uh, It is going to be the most comfort food you've ever eaten. So... Get I'm not ready. here to make friends. I'm here to I'm win. I'm here to win. So <laughs> I'm going to go pretty far from the from the historic, but looking back to Thomas, Je- Thomas Jefferson and those who came after him who created this dish, uh, I, you know, I think about my nephew uh, who loves his Kraft macaroni and cheese out of the blue box. Mm-hmm. And I think about um, the macaroni and cheese that you get at a meet and three in the South. And I think this dish is probably one of the most beloved and pop culture mm-hmm. centric dishes you can probably find. Right. So, And in a way, it's almost a bigger challenge to have something with which you're all familiar, so familiar in its modern capacity, you know, you yes. to sort of think about it both historically and meeting modern expectations. I think most of us have a macaroni and cheese recipe that we love and we don't want to veer away from. Mm-hmm. So I'm about, I'm about to knock that out and give you all the macaroni and cheese that you will live with for the rest of your life. Oh my Get ready. Gosh. <laughs> not, not, not that you're setting high expectations. Here, I I, Wait a minute. I have a question. Joby has a question. What's your what question? What do we win? I didn't realize how serious oh my you're going to take this. Because what, like, do, what do we win? I, I can level up. Uh, <laughs> like, I think we we probably win honor and glory, but mm. that's fine. I will. I'll. I, there, may, there has to be some prize, though. Everlasting podcast fame. Everlasting <laughs> podcast fame. A yes. gold spatula. A golden spatula. <laughs> that's what we win. Well, I will spatula. say the these the two of you having tasted your cooking, I uh, I have some good competition. So at least we're not all cooking the same thing. Right, and right. and I think this is a good 
sort of metaphor for what we're doing as well, which is even though this is a competition and we will be judged by two <laughs> very distinguished judges, it's also a meal that we're creating. And just to review for the listeners out there what this meal will consist of, we'll start off with a potage a la julienne, uh, have turkey and oysters with uh, asparagus with eggs, uh, an historic julep as our beverage, uh, macaroni and cheese as our side, and lemon ice cream for dessert. That sounds like a veritable feast, all emerging, all resonating from one Rosenbach collection object. So go us. We may be, we, we may be competitors, but we know how to put together a really great meal. Now, Kelsey, you had mentioned something about Judy having a cheese story to share with us. So I'm going to scooch the mic down the table, and Judy's going to tell us another Rosenbach uh, cheese story. Thanks, Alex, and thanks for that introduction to this um, wonderful artifact, Kelsey. We have in our collection a number of, of letters written by Thomas Jefferson, but this one is distinguished by its focus on cheese. So he writes to a correspondent uh, named Mr. Clay, about something that he himself, Jefferson himself, had uh, inscribed in his own travel diary. So when we're thinking about the Moxon book that Joby introduced us to being a travel diary, this is Thomas Jefferson's travel diary in action. Um, He was traveling throughout Italy and discovered, you know, what he called macaroni, which really would have described um, any pasta at that time. But more so, he was looking for foods that could be produced in the early United States. And a lot of our founders uh, participated in this search to determine what kinds of agricultural material could be produced in the climates that were contained in the early United States. So the idea here was to bolster the economy. um, And also it had a theoretical basis in the concept of American liberty um, in be, as being um, reflected in the production of food. Um, so that the idea here was that um, owning land was important to democracy, as we know from early voting patterns, but actually expanding the land ownership in the United States was equally important to them because it engaged more people in the process of choosing their own government and their own way of life Um, and thinking about the concepts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in their own terms. So Thomas Jefferson here writes to this gentleman who is living in around uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, um, and he's recommending that that might be an appropriate climate, somewhat similar in his time. Uh, Probably no climate is similar to his time now here in the United States, but uh, similar to the Lombard region of of Italy, where um, he found this Parmesan cheese originally produced. And he writes a very explicit uh, description of the kind of cheese, uh, even measuring it, talking about how it was made, how it looked when it was finished, what kinds of products went into making it, how much time. Um, And really, he's looking for people to start to try to make these kinds of products on their own farms so that we can get beyond um, a group of people living off of their land sort of for subsistence reasons, but actually making money in the process of creating food for our fellow citizens. And this notion that the expansion of land across the continent would bring about more farmers, um, which seems quaint in our times, but really was something that they anticipated would happen more than it actually has in the end, although we do have a lot of land now still committed to farming um, and raising livestock. So um, this is a document not only about food, but about its context, which is how um, the very mechanism of feeding ourselves plays into the context of uh, political growth um, and uh, the, the theories behind um, the new democracy here in America. Thank you so much, Judy, for telling us more about that really fascinating Jefferson letter. And I want to go back to this idea of how we are taking these essentially pieces of historical evidence, these individual menu items that we're encountering, and translating them into, into modern dishes uh, and through the lens of one issue that we've talked about a little bit already, which is dietary restrictions, uh, the modern palate, and how tastes have maybe changed, and um, why the recipes might look the, the way that they do uh, in, in the form that we have them in this artifact. And I would love to hear your comments, Judy and Elizabeth, on 
um, this issue of sort of taking historic recipes and using them in modern times, and then particularly this question of dietary restrictions and vegetarianism. Thanks, Alex. Well, I also want to thank my colleagues for being willing to um, consider the idea of looking at how we create a historic menu around uh, modern uh, eating patterns, even though there have been vegetarians since way back in history, certainly wasn't a common practice. And as we've seen from the menus that um, particularly Joby described earlier on, um, they were heavily meat-based. Uh, that might be just because uh, there's a preference for uh, for eating a lot of protein um, in the in the meal um, based on what people are doing uh, actively throughout the day, but also because um, we didn't have uh, you know an ability to transport food from warmer climates to colder ones in in the winter season. So some of these people who are eating you know particularly in the upper Midwest where some of these recipes are from. Uh, would not have seen a green vegetable um, except for during the, the you know, late spring and summer season. So um, we're really putting together a menu that is picked out of these various um, recipes and, um, and recipe books that enables us to eat a more modern menu that will accommodate um, my vegetarianism. Um, and granted, I'm not a vegan. This is, um, you know, I'm an ovo-lacto-vegetarian, so I'll be able to partake of the um, macaroni and cheese and the asparagus and eggs. Um, and um, that makes me very happy that I can still taste historic food, um, or at least food inspired by history, and, um, and still maintain my own dietary restrictions. So um, this is all uh, very exciting, and I can't wait to try everybody's modern twists on um, these recipes that we found um, in our collections. So Elizabeth, I see you have something else from our collections that represents um, a, a work that we have that actually refers to vegetarianism. Yes, uh, this is uh, by an English antiquary, today we might say a, a literary historian, named Joseph Ritson. Uh, his, he lived essentially in the second half of the 18th century and uh, was best known for gathering and publishing early versions of English nursery rhymes and most especially the er early forms of the Robin Hood legend. He became a vegetarian at the age of 20 after reading a sort of philosophical treatise uh, about uh, bees and uh, spent the rest of his life uh, as an activist for vegetarianism and animal rights. Uh, like a lot of uh, liberal thinking people of his day, he was very much inspired by the ideals of the French Revolution. Um, this is one of his last publications, an essay on abstinence from animal food as a moral duty. It is several hundred pages long and describes all the evils that he sees uh, proceeding from reliance on animal food, from uh, cruelty to animals, to the um, unhealthy effects that a meat-based diet has on the body. He um, finishes with a long chapter about the uh, history of societies that have uh, subsisted entirely on vegetable food, as he puts it. From he, he goes throughout history and across the globe and cites examples of the, the diets of, of various societies. Um, he was not surprisingly regarded as something of a crank. Uh, he did uh, he did and uh, his spent his last years in a uh, uh, mental asylum. Um, whether how much of that was uh, because he truly had a mental illness and how much was it just because society couldn't <laughs> couldn't deal with his ideas. Um, but the uh, frontispiece of this book is a, a rather wonderful, if uh, uh, biased, caricature of him. He is standing at a table in a study surrounded by books and strings of onions and beets. Uh, he is writing with a pen which is dipped in a uh, an inkwell that's labeled gall. Um, he's got some of his writings uh, strewn around the floor. And uh, there is a very friendly-looking cow sticking its head through the window, munching on a large bowl of greens. 
Can I just note that I really love that they depict him wearing what looks like a really old form of Birkenstocks on his feet. Um, it's sort of like that sort of hippie vegetarianism, except way back in time. It's kind of funny. And he couldn't wear leather, I take it. it I, I would assume that he wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, they are... Um, yeah, they look like uh, sort of 18th century buckled shoes, except they're open toed. His mm-hmm. big bare toes are sticking out. I think it's really charming. And we'll be sure to make sure uh, that, that this image also ends up on the Rosenbach Podcast's website so you listeners can study it for yourselves and um, enjoy his very large protruding toes in those lovely shoes. They're, they're speaking of menus, there's a menu here. There's a bill of fare. Uh, nettle soup, sauerkraut, horse beans, onions, and leeks. Wow. So that How maybe that, that makes up for all the missing vegetables from our hotel menus. Right. Well, thank you for pulling that book. It's really fascinating to see the long history of vegetarianism represented in the Rosenbach's collection. And now we need to get down to some serious business, which is outlining the criteria that our distinguished judges will use in assessing the recipes that we've prepared. And I know that Judy and Elizabeth have spent some time thinking through this important issue uh, and have essentially created a rubric uh, to use when they are critiquing the recipes in which we can now use to guide the work that we are doing. And so, Elizabeth and Judy, I would like to ask you just to walk us through what these criteria are so that the the contestants are prepared for the competition ahead. So I'll start with the first one. Um, So obviously we're going to assess its flavor. How does it taste? Is it pleasing to our palates? And what historical issues should we consider when assessing how it tastes? We'll also be thinking about the texture, the mouth feel, uh, if you will. So presentation, um, to really be competitors in this, our colleagues have to be able to not just throw the food in front of us in a casual manner. Um, We want to make sure that it's artfully and elegantly presented. Alex and Kelsey have already talked a bit about authenticity uh, based on what we know of the dish. Now, we, we are admittedly not attempting to stick directly to any period recipe, uh, but uh, we'll be looking at how the cooks have tried to reproduce the dish. Have they, have they uh, gone for any degree of accuracy to what we know of historical versions? And last, um, historical interest. Um, setting aside the taste, um, we want to know whether the selection uh, brings some historical interest with it that um, that really merits being showcased both for Elizabeth and for me, but also to our podcast listeners. Well, thank you both so much for outlining these criteria that you will use as you assess the recipes. It's both, I will confess, a little intimidating to think of the journey that we are about to embark upon, but also really exciting to know that you've given so much thought to how you will Uh, judge these recipes. So thank you very much for that. You know, I just want to, as we conclude this episode, I just want to observe that, in my opinion, this work that we're doing around um, recreating in in, in an imaginative, creative fashion these food items that we found in an historical source material, it's a perfect metaphor for the work that we do around interpretation at the Rosenbeck every single day. You know, the bottom line is that the past, past culture, past society, is fundamentally lost to us. We can't truly understand wholly what it was like to live and to think and to feel in a past time. What we have at our disposal are the material artifacts, some text-based, some not text-based, that enable us to at least try to access the lost past. And I think that this is an interesting exercise in the philosophy of history as well. Uh, just to think about, you know, to what extent do we truly know our past? To what extent can we, and to what extent are we using our own imaginations to recreate it out of these wonderful artifacts? So um, thank you all so much, everyone, for looking at all of these books and manuscripts with me today. I am absolutely excited to move the party into the kitchen and actually test out some of these dishes. Thank you, Alex. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Alex. I'm really looking forward to tasting some of these treats. Thanks, Alex. I'm looking forward to putting my, you know, at home life to work life all in one room. Thanks, Alex. I can't wait to share my delicious macaroni and cheese casserole with all of you.
Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach Museum and Library's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, art, and culture. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach Museum and Library and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. If you cannot make a financial contribution, please give our podcast a good rating on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to help us build our audience. The theme music for season two of the podcast is a setting of the poem Longings, written by poet, artist, and educator Nellie Rathbone Bright in 1927. Bright co-founded the Black Opals, a collective and literary journal showcasing young Black writers in Philadelphia in the late 1920s. The musical version featured here was performed by Yolanda Wisher, Paul Geis, V. Shane Frederick, Mark Anthony Palacio, and Sir Lance Gamble. I want to flee to a cool the Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation about history on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. In the heart of me, drums in my ears, and my lips are wet with the tang of the sea.